guys hear me? Good? All right. Why don't we go ahead and get started so that we give our speaker plenty of time today. I think some more faculty are going to uh, come in from their last meeting. So it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, Jeff Rasmussen, who is a postdoc at UCLA and is an, app and is an applicant, a candidate for a position in the you guys hear me? Translational Good. Good. Biology All right. Center here at Why don't we go ahead and get started I think so what's really interesting about that his career, career is the way that he's gonna, transformed uh, himself and come in and learn new meeting. techniques at each step. So it's a pleasure uh, today to introduce he started uh, at Brown, uh, and who is a postdoc at as UCLA a and is a computer an science and student at Brown, and kind of got into this for medics and bioinformatics. And you guys hear And ended up getting his degree in computational biology. Right. Bio Why don't we go ahead and get right. left Brown and think what you're really interested in about that. The next career is the way that he's transformed. University of Washington come in and learn new techniques. Started as a pleasure today to introduce in a started at Brown, cell biology lab, at UCLA, unbelievable science student at Brown, and kind of got into for medically or bioinformatic, you guys hear me? Ended up getting a degree in biology. Why don't we go ahead and get left forward and think we give them the interesting in undergrad and next year? The way that he's transferred to the University of Washington, he has been able to learn new techniques. He started as a pleasure today to introduce the start of the round. He sells biology down to the start at UCLA, unbelievable science, regular math background. And while he was doing that, he kind of expanded the career of bioinformatics. Why don't we go ahead and get that? Also, we give him the next year. He was at the University of Washington. He made it last year. And he started as a pleasure today. He started as a pleasure. I imagine that it would be worse then, getting into mouth mounting. And while he was doing that, he kind of expanded the career of bioinformatics. Why don't we go ahead and get that? Also, we give him the next year. He made it more dramatic for the elegant to really get it under the sun. And he started as a pleasure today. So he, I imagine, that it would be worse. Productivity throughout the year. 
pressures really on uh, for him. The productivity is out and he put that with the Red Wings to a 399 all the time. Really on, uh, for him. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that very thorough introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <clears throat> so, can you guys hear me okay? So, I'm, I'm really interested in the mechanisms that promote tissue plasticity during organ development in the chair. And in particular, the nervous system has a really remarkable ability to um, remodel its productivity. Um, and the and the and the the so today I'm going to be sharing with you a first look at how sensory nerves remodel and repair themselves in the living fish skin. So the particular organ I've been focused on is the skin, which is one of our most regenerative tissues and is constantly remodeling. Now the skin is not just a barrier, but is also a really finely tuned sensory organ. So I don't want you to focus on the details of this diagram here, but the point is that there are a variety of different sensory structures in the skin that are specialized for detecting different types of um, stimuli. And the particular type of neurons that I've been focused on are the pain sensors that innervate out in the epidermis. <clears throat> and these endings are incredibly large and complex. For example, a single ending in the mouse skin can have up to a thousand branches just within the epidermis. Now this image over here shows what the mature skin looks like, but there are two really important developmental processes that help shape the skin. And this really changes the environment encountered by these axons during development. The first of these developmental processes is stratification of the epidermis. And this is driven by proliferation of basal stem cells and results in a thickening of the epidermis. And this is shown here in the embryonic mouse skin. Now, a second major event is the development of dermal appendages, like glands, hairs, or even uh, fish scales. <clears throat> and appendage development really remodels the surface of the skin, as you can see here, from a neonatal mouse into an adult mouse. You completely reshape the surface of this organ. Now, a third type of remodeling is actually one that my skin is currently undergoing thanks to a recent trip to the dermatologist. And that is wound healing. So this is what my dermatologist did recently. And most, um, most studies of wound healing have been focused on mechanisms of epithelial repair, which you can see over here. But anytime you cut your skin, you're also damaging sensory endings within the skin. So I've been really interested in how <clears throat> developmental changes in the skin as well as injury impact the biology of sensory endings within the skin. And today I've divided my talk into two parts. So the first part of the talk is thinking about the developmental question about how sensory innervation is remodeled during some of these dramatic changes in the skin. And this will take up about two-thirds of the talk. Now the second part is thinking about what's going on in my skin right now, which is how are sensory axons repaired following injury? And this will be the last 10 or 15 minutes or so. That is not my skin. <laughs> but it looks very similar to that. So now, in both cases, my, my focus has really been on examining the interactions between the sensory endings and the cells in the environment around them. So if we turn our attention to the developmental question, most of what we know about sensory innervation comes from um, studies in larval animals. So for example, the larval fruit fly shown here. And what these studies have found is that sensory neurites along the, the surface of the, the fly form this beautiful tiled arrangement to evenly and comprehensively cover the skin to create a really orderly topographic map of the skin. Now during lar larval fly growth, this pattern is maintained by scaling of the neurites in conjunction with their associated epidermal cells. And during fly metamorphosis, this, um, these endings are dramatically reshaped by undergoing a pruning 
and regrowth process, and they develop a new neurite pattern in the adult skin. <clears throat> so these three mechanisms, tiling, scaling, and pruning, really nicely explain how um, sensory neurites are patterned in insects. But I would argue that these mechanisms are insufficient to describe uh, how neurites deal with growth on a much more extreme scale, such as that that occurs during vertebrate development, like that shown here. And although no one really thinks about vertebrates changing as much as insects do, as you can see here in the fish, both the body plan as well as the surface of the skin have been completely remodeled during this animal's growth. Now, the idea of investigating post-embryonic remodeling is a challenging one, <clears throat> but is one that I'm really fascinated by. <clears throat> and in order to tackle this issue, I've been developing the zebrafish as a model system because of its really nice genetic imaging and in vivo manipulation possibilities. Now, furthermore, in contrast to the mouse, where many of the changes in skin maturation happen in utero, we can watch all these things happen in fish because of its external development. So I've summarized some of the things I've told you here, where <clears throat> you can see in adult fish, you have this dramatic reorganization of the skin during development. But before I started this project, there were some really big unknowns. So for example, we actually had no idea how axons were organized in the adult skin in fish. Furthermore, we didn't have a model for how axons were spaced across this much larger surface area in adults. So to try to understand how axons are patterned in this adult system, <clears throat> this will be the focus of part one of the talk. So I've broken this into these three questions here. So the first question is, what does adult sensory innervation even look like in the adults? And um, the second part is trying to understand how axons are assembled in space during the remodeling process. And in the third part, I'd like to think about how changes in organization of the skin are going to influence sensory axon remodeling. Now, in order to address this first question, I first needed to develop tools and methods to be able to image in adult fish. Since most work on zebrafish, about 99%, I would say, of the work in fish has been done on the larval system. Right? So, First, let me introduce, um, before I tell you about these new tools, let me briefly introduce the adult anatomy, okay? Now, if you're like me, you probably haven't given much thought to fish scales, except maybe cooking dinner in the kitchen or something, right? But it turns out the anatomy is kind of interesting. So, based on some uh, older electron microscopy studies, what we know is that the epidermis, which is shown here in green, coats the outer surface of the scales on the side of the fish. And these scales, uh, which I've shown in pink here, are made from bone, okay? So <clears throat> to understand how sensory axons fit into this picture, I first needed a method to be able to study them. And really the breakthrough came here when I found a paper that described a method to intubate adult fish. And this is actually quite simple. All you need is some tubing and a peristaltic pump and a specialized imaging chamber, and then you can take an adult fish directly mount it under the compocal microscope and peer right inside of its skin. And if you told me at the beginning of my postdoc that I was going to be intubating adult fish routinely, I would have thought you were a little bit crazy. But <laughs> turns out this is a really powerful technique. So now, um, using this system, we can apply modern genetic tools to study skin cell biology. So an example is shown here, where you have an image of a living fish that's expressing GFP in its keratinocytes and RFP in uh, bone-producing cells that form the scale. And you can see we've recapitulated what we knew from the EM studies. So how do sensory axons fit into this picture? Well, I identified a marker of sensory axons that's really strongly expressed in the adult skin. And what I've discovered is that the axons show a really beautiful pattern in, in, that had never been described before. And in particular, what you can see are these bundles of axons which I've indicated with these blue arrows, that radiate out across the surface of the scale in this nice, even distribution. And this really contrasts with the simplified and disorganized axon pattern that's found on the, on the surface of the larval fish, where there's really no organization at all to these, to these endings. And now, a second observation I made here was that these bundles of axons show a really remarkable congruence 
with blood vessels, as you can see here. So in the, it, the overlay is a little bit hard to see, but basically there's a perfect correlation here between these blood vessels and where these bundles of axons are. And the congruence between nerves and blood vessels has been observed in mammalian skin as well. For example, in this image from Albert Pan's graduate work um, of the mouse ear, you can see a pattern very reminiscent of what I'm seeing in the fish. <clears throat> so these observations about these axon bundles in association with blood vessels raise the exciting possibility that there might be nerves that had not been described before on the surface of these fish scales. So to look at that, what I did is, if we zoom in on one of these bundles, what I did is look for markers of cells that would associate with, uh, with nerves. So for example, shown here are Schwann cells in red that you can see are tightly associated with these axons that run in this nice, this nice pattern. And by next performing TEM through one of these nerves, what I found are groupings of axons that are ensheathed by Schwann cell membrane like that. Another observation from the EM was that it looks like there's some extracellular matrix surrounding this axon glial unit. So I looked for markers of the ECM that be associated with these bundles. And what I found is that they're really um, highly enriched for the ECM protein laminin. You can see here is coating these bundles, but not their endings out in the epidermis. And finally, I showed you already that they associate, these bundles associate with blood vessels. But this blood vessel organization is really interesting because what you have are typically two capillaries, one of which is an artery, shown in red, and the other is a vein in blue. And these form a little loop out at the end. So, and these are very similar to capillary loops that we find in, uh, in human skin. So based on all these observations, I concluded that these are a new, um, new nerves, and they share a lot of properties with peripheral nerves that have been described in other systems. Yeah? Yeah, so you're pointing out this one that's extra large right here, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, um, well, there, there are none that are myelinated here. So they're all um, unmyelinated, and I ha they're, you know, all relatively the same size, you know, if you measure them. But um, I haven't noticed any grouping based on size. Yeah, no one has gotten to that level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting, though, yeah, yeah. But there may be ones innervating different structures or detecting different modalities. Out there. Yeah, that's a good point. OK, so to summarize, what, um, what I just showed you is that in the adult skin, I found there are these evenly spaced nerves, which really contrast with the organization in the larval skin. And <clears throat> I next turned uh, to the, this, I'd next like to focus on this question of spacing. And I thought that by studying how axons are assembled into these nerves, we might learn something about how they're spaced within the skin. So <clears throat> in particular, I want to I wanna focus on interactions between the ECM, the axons, and the blood vessels for this next part of the talk. So how can we study um, nerve assembly in an adult animal? Well, there's a really unique way to do this in fish, and that's by looking at scale regeneration, which is really easy to do. You can simply remove a scale from the side of the fish using a pair of forceps, and then watch as the scale regenerates. So I'll show you a movie here where you can see I've marked the sensory axons in red, and then the scale edge is shown in green. And I'm going to remove this scale right here, and you can watch as the tissue regenerates. And I've noted the, the, the days right here on the bottom right. So you can see the scale gets removed, and then over the course of about two weeks, you're able to see the scale and axons regenerate right on the side of the, the fish. Now, by taking um, si samples of regenerating scales at different time points, you can get a sense for how regenerating axons are behaving in the context of this regenerating organ. So <clears throat> this experiment was actually done by an undergraduate in the lab T. And so she sampled these scales at different time points. And what she found is that axons regenerate into the scale along this axis, so left to right on the screen. 
and somewhat um, fortuitously by co-staining these with phylloidin just to look at general cell morphology within the scale, we noticed that there were these clear tracts of cells that preceded axon growth right here, that where you see elongated cells that look like they're in the path of where the axons and nerves will eventually form. So I wondered if this was also true during normal development. So T again um, did this experiment where she looked at juvenile fish which are staged simply by their length. So 12 millimeters up to 16 millimeters goes mid to late juvenile period. And what she found is that initially you see a similar observation where you have these tracts of cells that are devoid of axons. But then later during scale development, you can see they become densely innervated over on the right here. And so I thought this was really exciting because now we're, we're watching the remodeling process happen in the, in the fish skin. And furthermore, these results are consistent with the scale regeneration data and suggest that whatever cells are forming these tracts might be guiding the axons into the skin. So how can we test if these tracts of cells are able to, to guide regenerating axons? Well, to test this possibility, what I did is this fun experiment where I transplanted scales between adult fish. So in this experiment, I took a scale from a wild type fish and transferred it into a second fish that has a defect in pigmentation as well as a transgene that marks the sensory axons in red. And what you can see is just on the side of the fish, you can easily pick out the transplanted scale from its difference in pigmentation. So if we look at how the transplant behaves, what you see are that sensory axons after just three days can robustly regenerate uh, regenerate into this donor tissue, right? So these are host axons regenerating in here. And then by staining for laminin, what I found is that some of the regenerating axons are able to grow along the donor tracks. So together, these three experiments, the regeneration data, the de development data, as well as the transplant data, suggest that <clears throat> these tracks go into the skin prior to nerve formation. And these tracks, whatever they are, are really important for organizing these nerves in the skin. Now they also suggested that the tracts might be able to form in the absence of axons since it looks like they're forming ahead of innervation. So to test that, what I did is examine mutants in the ERB3 receptor which blocks sensory neuron as well as Schwann cell development. And remarkably these animals are homozygous viable. So if you isolate scales from these fish, what you see is that most of them lack sensory innervation. So then I stained these scales for laminin to label the tracks. And remarkably, I found that these tracks look really normal in the ERB3 mutants. And that suggests that they can form um, independently of axons in Schwann cells. So what are, what are some other cell types that could be making these nerve tracks? Well, the blood vessels are certainly a candidate. And from <clears throat> the mammalian literature, there are two models for how axons and blood vessels can align. So the first model is from looking at sympathetic innervation. And in this case, it's thought that blood vessels um, secrete factors that help, help guide axons. In contrast to that, in the mammalian skin, it's thought that nerves are the ones that secrete chemokines and growth factors that promote vessel alignment. <clears throat> so to try to understand in the fish skin what this relationship is, I first asked if blood vessels are the pioneering cell type in these nerve tracts. So I did this simply by looking at a particular developmental stage. So this is going back to the juvenile fish, the 16 millimeter stage, where you can see some of these nerves have formed with the white arrows here. And then if you look at blood vessels in green, you see they haven't grown along those paths yet. So this is a, a growing blood vessel here shown with the blue arrow. So this suggests that innervation precedes vascularization and also suggested that one possibility would be that the sensory axons are required to pattern the blood vessels. So to address that question, what I did is went back to the ERB3 mutants, which again, as you can see, really have a profound defect in their sensory innervation along the skin and looked at their blood vessels. And what I found is that they're actually totally normal in the mutant. So you can see this nice same pattern of evenly spaced blood vessels across the surface of, of the, the skin there. 
So this suggests that um, axons and the vessels are both independently patterned in the skin. And it also suggests that whatever the mechanism is here in fish, it's unlike both the sympathetic and the cutaneous nerve vessel alignment that's been described in mouse. So it also raised the really intriguing question of what are these other cells that are creating the nerve tracks, right? So there must be some other cell type that's making these. <clears throat> so a uh, uh, hint as to this came when we went back and looked at the literature focusing on the bony scales themselves. So what you can see here on the left is a scanning EM of the surface of a single fish scale where all the cells have been removed. And you're just left with the pattern of bony features on the surface of the scale. And what you can see is there's some really beautiful patterns, including these ones that run roughly from the center of the scale out to the edge, like this, in a very similar pattern to where I've seen the blood vessels and nerves. And if you, these are called radii. And if you look at high magnification of a single one of these, what you see is these are actually grooves that are etched in the surface of the scale. So do the nerves and vessels align? Well, you can easily see the radii with polarized light. And so if you look at the radii, they match up perfectly with where the blood vessels and axons are. So this was really exciting. And furthermore, if you look at lots and lots of scales, some of the scales, you'll notice there are deviations from this kind of uniform radial pattern that you see in kind of a young adult animal. In particular, if you look at scales from old animals, like this one shown here, you see a really increased density of radii, and they kind of have a somewhat disorganized look to them. But the axons follow exactly the pattern that the radii have. So this really got me thinking that whatever's creating the radii is probably the, the cells that are creating these tracks and pattern, helping to pattern the nerves. So I went back and looked at cells that are involved in bone production or bone degradation. And I'll just show you the cells that are involved in bone production, production, which are called osteoblasts. So here you're looking at a series of scales of increasing size. And these are all from a stage prior to innervation, looking at an osteoblast-specific transgene. And what you can see on the right-hand side here is that the radii form by osteoblasts migrating in from the posterior edge of the scale. So these are, and remember, this is prior to innervation. So these are really the the pioneering cell type. <clears throat> Furthermore, if you look at, at an early stage at the pattern of laminin, shown in red here, it really matches with the pattern of where these osteoblasts are. So I think not only are osteoblasts pioneering these tracts, they're also involved in producing this laminin-rich ECM. And the last point here is just that the osteoblasts are stable components of these nerves. So if you look at the adult skin, you can see osteoblasts are co-mingling right along with, with the axons there. OK, so to go back to our model, what I think is happening is the osteoblasts are this cell type that's creating the ECM and tracks, but then is independently patterning these two other cell types, the axons and the vessels. So if we were to draw out the model, it would look something like this, where you have osteoblasts migrating and depositing laminin. Subsequent to that, you have axons and glia pathfinding along that track that's created. And then um, this allows axons to innervate out into the epidermis. And then one last point here is that down here you'd have the blood vessels growing in at a later stage. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you're basically you're asking how do the radii form, right? And how do they get in that pattern? Yeah, that's something I'm really interested in, something nobody has looked at, actually. So, but I think you're right that they really form this, this nice pattern here where they all end up kind of merging at the center of the scale. Yeah, nothing's been done on that, but I think, so. yeah. Yeah, I thought it was the other way around when I first, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I don't know if there's, yeah, there could be, I mean, the DRGs proliferate throughout at least juvenile development. I don't know about in the adult, but uh, there could be new neurons there, or it could just be they're adding branches. Uh, yeah, interesting, I don't know. Yeah, 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 very interesting, yeah, in terms of how the radii are actually formed, right? And then you, how do you get those grooves? So I can clearly see osteoblasts sitting right in the radii by electron microscopy. I've looked for osteoclasts. I, we initially thought they were going to be a really good candidate. Um, and there have been some studies that have associated them with the radii. But using a transgenic marker that we have that, that labels osteoclasts specifically, I've seen no real evidence that they're involved. But an other experiment that we did to address that was looking, so I looked at a, a mutant that lacks osteoclasts, and the radii look normal, the nerves look normal. So suggest they're not involved, but I wouldn't say it's really conclusive. Yeah, there could still be some, some interplay there. Okay, so, and I think this is, um, you know, some of these questions are, are sort of along the lines of what I was thinking of when I, when I first made this discovery. But really, if you think about, there are lots of examples in biology of interactions between uh, bone cells, sensory nerves, and um, blood vessels. So for example, long bones, the cranial foramina in our face, our teeth, or even, this is Alvaro's favorite example, uh, deer antlers. There are really lots of examples where these three types of cells are, are, have a lot of interplay together. So now the question is, why would you want to pattern the nerves in this particular way with these radii? Well, I'll summarize what I think is going on on this slide. So um, what, these, what these scale nerves do is they take really disorganized nerves from the dermis, and they funnel them into these nicely, evenly spaced nerves across the scale surface. And then because the scales are so regularly arranged with respect to one another, this creates a nice, even pattern of sensory innervation across the surface of the fish. Right, so this provides a potential mechanism of how you're going to innervate the, the fish skin. So if we go back to our table, what I think is going on is these grooves, these radii, are probably involved in spacing the nerves across, across the skin. Now one thing I haven't told you about their modeling process yet is that there are actually different populations of neurons that innervate the larval skin. These are known as Rohan beard neurons, and these are present in fish, frogs, and possibly even mammals. And in the adult skin, innervation is done by dorsal root ganglion neurons. So when exactly does this transition between Rohan beard and dorsal root ganglion innervation occur? Well, based on some previous work that examined early larval development, it was proposed that Rohan beards were eliminated at just three days of development by programmed cell death. And then the assumption was that they're functionally replaced by dorsal root ganglion neurons, as shown here. But really, there is a, um, not great evidence for this. So in experiments I don't have time to show you today, I went back and examined this by looking at mutants as well as um, transgenes that are specifically expressed in DRG neurons. And I found that the switch occurs much later than previously thought. And actually, you know, this is just a shift on the graph here, but this is a, is a change of about two months of developmental time. So it's really later than what people had previously thought. And the other observation I made here is that this switch between these two um, types of neurons is preceded right by scale development within the skin. So this got me thinking that formation of the scales might be really important for the remodeling process. So, and that brings me to the third part, third question here of the first part which is how do changes in the organization of the skin influence remodeling? And so to test the role of scales in regulating innervation, I first looked at regeneration. So <clears throat> I tested this by removing two rows of scales, which are indicated with these asterisks here, either from control fish. So here, this is one week after the scales have been removed. You can see in controls, they've regenerated. Um, or I compared them to fish where I'd ablated osteoblasts. And my prediction was ablating osteoblasts would prevent the scales from regenerating. And that's indeed what you can see over here. So did this impact sensory re of the skin? And what I found is that 
there is a uh, significant reduction of the innervation in the osteoblast ablated fish. And this is probably an underestimate because a lot of these thicker axons here, I think, are down in the dermis. So I next wondered if the same thing might be true during normal scale development. So before I, I tell you about mutants that affect scale development, let me, let me just describe the wild type pattern. So if you look at a wild type fish that has scales all over its, its trunk, and you look in high magnification at the epidermis, you see they're all really regularly arranged across the, the, the surface of the animal. And the axons follow that same pattern. And actually what it, what's happening is you have uh, cell bodies of the DRGs are way up here by the spinal cord. Then they send these long nerves that run in a dorsal ventral orientation down the body of the animal. And then those, those nerves take a 90 degree turn when they encounter the scales and they're reoriented along this anterior-posterior axis. So what, ha what would happen in an animal that didn't have any scales? <clears throat> so we can address this by looking at mutations in this gene called ectodysplasin that prevents, um, loss of this gene prevents dermal appendage formation in a lot of different types of animals. So, and you can see that here has no scales on, on the side of the fish. And if you look at the epidermis, now you see a really smooth appearance. So, what do the neurons look like? Well, what I found is the nerves now fail to reorient. So now they're just running all in this dorsal ventral orientation, suggesting the scales are required for this reorientation process. So I also looked at a second kind of scale mutant, <coughs> which is mutation in the FGF receptor. And this mutant has a much more patchy appearance of the scales on, on, this, on its side. And what I noticed is that a lot of the scales that are remaining are coming out at these kind of odd angles across the skin. And in particular, you can see some that are coming out completely backwards, shown with those blue arrows. So what I did is then trace the nerves that run into those backward scales. And I found that those nerves are following the reverse reversal of the scales. So I've diagrammed that over here. So these two experiments suggest that the scales are both necessary and sufficient for reorienting the nerves in the skin. Now, since the scales are, seem to be involved in routing the sensory nerves, I hypothesized that they'd be in, also involved in promoting innervation of the epidermis. So I looked at that by examining either Eta heterozygous animals or the FGF mutants. And both of these types of mutants have areas of their skin where there are scales, which I've shown with the kind of yellow pseudo coloring here, and areas of their skin where they have no scales. Or na so naked skin versus squamated skin. And the naked skin is blue here. So if we look at the pattern of axons, what you see is that there's, if you just focus right here, you can see a really nice dense innervation on top of the scale surface, but a much reduced innervation in the naked skin. And I've quantified that over here, where I've just taken projections through the entire epidermis and dermis. You can see there's at least a 50% reduction in the, in the innervation density. But this is probably, again, an underestimate, because if you look carefully at the cross-section, what you can see is the areas with the scales, a lot of the axons are in the epidermis. But in the naked skin, it's not only thinner, but most of the axons are down in the dermis. So <clears throat> to summarize this part, I'll just go over this really quickly. Basically, I've, I've developed new tools and a new system to study sensory remodeling in the juvenile and adult fish. And I think osteoblasts and scales are really important for promoting um, innervation of the skin as well as um, skin maturation and orienting nerve polarity. Now, you might be asking yourself, what about other kinds of animals that don't have scales, like birds or mammals, right? Well, it turns out, although these, these animals look quite different, right? They have feathers or hair on their surface. <coughs> these are uh, actually also regularly spaced dermal appendages. And these kinds of dermal appendages all go through a common developmental step and use common signaling mechanisms. And so the common developmental step is the formation of a placode. You can see here that for fish scales, chicken feathers, or mouse hair, you have a similar intermediate, which is potentially creating guideposts across the surface of the skin that could be used to pattern um, innervation in these other animals as well. So I'd be really interested in trying to look at mutations in um, in placode forming genes in these other kinds of animals.
In terms of specific future directions for this part, looking at sensory modeling during post-larval development, I'm really interested in how these different cell types, Rohan beards, DRGs, and scales might influence one another during the remodeling process. I'm also interested in what regulates the timing of remodeling. So how is that determined? And we have some hints as to what, what the molecules might be. And third is what are the local signals that are affecting nerve polarity and spacing? So for example, one candidate would be the sonic hedgehog pathway where you can see here it form, forms an a asymmetric pattern just at the posterior edge of each scale, which is similar to kind of the polarity that I see of the nerves. This would be a good candidate to look at for regulating um, nerve growth in the skin. All right, so in the last 10 minutes or so, I'd like to turn to uh, the related question of how sensory axons are repaired following injury. So although I'm interested in the entire repair process, I've just been focused so far on the first step of repair, which is removal of cellular debris, which is thought to be important for preventing inflammation and promoting, pr promoting regeneration. Okay, so in addition to axon degeneration that can occur during uh, sensory or uh, sensory remodeling, traumatic injury, diabetes, or chemotherapeutic drugs can also cause degeneration of sensory endings in the skin. And if you lose your sensory endings in the skin, you can develop peripheral neuropathies, where you get numbness or uh, pain in your extremities. So I think that understanding the basic mechanisms of sensory repair is really important for how we might be able to treat these diseases in the future. And so the ability to clear up neuronal debris is really fundamental to nervous system remodeling and repair. So some of the types of events that can create neuronal debris are shown here, such as axon pruning, cell death, synapse elimination, or what I've been studying, axon degeneration and regeneration. And in all these cases, you need uh, the participation of non-neuronal cells to clean up sensory or sorry, to clean up neuronal debris. So these would be phagocytic cells that can eat, eat this debris. So for part two, I'd like to address what are the cells that eat degenerating axons in the simple larval skin? This is how this project got started. Next, how can we study degeneration and phagocytosis in the adult skin? And finally, are the phagocytes similar or different in larval versus adult skin? Okay, so using the larval fish model, um, we can watch the entire degeneration and regeneration process in a living fish. So here, you're looking at a little piece of the trunk of the fish. And what I've done is use a two-photon laser to cut this axon in the middle here. As I play this movie, what you'll see is that the axon degenerates. Then almost immediately, the axon debris disappears from the skin. So we got interested in what are the cell types that are removing that debris so quickly from the skin. So we first hypothesized that <coughs> um, there would be cells similar to phagocytic cells that have been described that eat debris and other kinds of peripheral nerves, specifically blood cells or glial cells. But when we genetically removed those two cell types, we saw not a big change in the amount of time it took to clear axon debris from the skin, suggesting there might be another phagocytic cell type in the skin. And these cell types were not even um, if you track blood cells, they're not even coming close to where the debris is. And we got a hint as to what um, cells this might be from an EM study that the lab did, looking at degenerating axons within the epidermis. And what, <clears throat> what this study found is that skin cells can send out these little protrusions that appear to interact with degenerating bits of axon. So this got me thinking that skin cells might be the phagocytes that are eating axon debris. But how can we test if skin cells are eating axon debris? <clears throat> now, since skin cells are not generally thought to be phagocytic, there weren't a lot of existing tools to study this process. So the first thing I did was create a transgenic fish reporter <clears throat> that labels phagosomes throughout the fish skin. You can see that here, nicely covering the surface of the animal. And if you look in high magnification, you see little phagosomes that look just like I've drawn them in. Okay, so to test if skin cells could be eating debris, I repeated my laser exotomy experiment in the presence of this keratinocyte um, transgene, where I've labeled the right, labeled phagosomes in green. And if we watch what happens, what you can see is the axons degenerate, the debris ends up 
right inside those skin phagosomes. <clears throat> Furthermore, I noticed that this phagocytosis by the skin is really rapid. So the difference between this panel and this panel is just four minutes. But you can see the debris has already entered phagosomes in the skin. So this really highlights the dynamics of the process and suggests that skin cells are really poised to be able to clear up debris. <clears throat> so I next got interested in understanding if skin cells were just specialized phagocytes for axon debris, or if they could eat other kinds of cellular debris they might encounter in the skin. So I did this experiment here where I mosaically labeled keratinocytes in red, and then uh, I laser ablated these two cells right here. And then what I found is that some of that red debris ended up in their neighbors, suggesting that skin cells could cannibalize other skin cells after injury. And I think this has really important implications, not just for sensory repair, but also for um, you know, wound healing response in the skin. So this phagocytic nature of keratinocytes has not really been previously appreciated. OK, so now let's move on to looking at the adult skin. And the reason for looking at the adult skin, yeah, go ahead. So Schwann cells are the only glia that, that are there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so how can we study degeneration and phagocytosis in the adult skin where it's not quite as easy to do laser ablations in adult animals? And then I'll show you a new assay I developed to look at this, and then I'll tell you about the phagocytes I found in the adult skin. Okay, so if we go back to our scale um, removal, remember I told you you can move a scale just with a pair of forceps from the side of this, the fish. And what I've been doing is discarding these scales, right? But it turns out that you can actually culture them and image them to watch degeneration happen in a nicely um, sort of pre-packaged tissue explant where you have all the resident cell types of the skin right, right here in the epidermis. So if you do this in a transgenic fish where you've labeled the sensory axons, what you see are that the axons degenerate after about three hours, and then the debris ends up in all these different kinds of phagocytic cells here. So I wondered if um, the degeneration I was seeing of these axon endings was because the axons got sick after I transected them by removing the scale. So I tested that by repeating the experiment in the presence of a small molecule, FK866, which we know prevents Wallerian degeneration after axon injury. So if I play this movie now, and you focus on this axon up here, for example, you can see this axon remains healthy, extending growth cones throughout the course of this 20-hour movie. So that suggests this, these axons are not degenerating because they're sick, but rather from a specific degenerative process. So what are the relevant phagocytes in the adult skin? Well, if we go back and watch this first movie I showed you again, and if you just concentrate on this middle area right here, where all the free sensory endings are between keratinocytes, what I want you to notice is there are two populations of phagocytic cells. There are some that are really highly motile, moving all around, and other ones that are stationary, where you see the debris end up as these little dots. So I, I thought that these ones that uh, had this dot-like appearance are consistent with the idea that keratinocytes might be eating debris in adults as well. So I looked at that again by uh, using a transgene to label keratinocyte phagosomes in green, and then watch degeneration happen. And what I found is that some of the debris ended up in the, inside the keratinocytes. So this suggested that <coughs> the phagocytic ability of keratinocytes is not simply some kind of larval adaptation, but is present throughout this animal's lifespan. And is also important for understanding how, you know, wounding in the adult skin, say for, for example, in our bodies, might be, might be uh, repaired. But what about those highly motile cells I saw moving all around? Well, it turns out that the epidermis above the scales is really packed full of blood cells. So uh, three of those cell types are shown here. So there are longer Han cells, which are thought to be dendritic cells that monitor the epidermis for appearance of foreign pathogens. There are neutrophils, which are thought to be kind of first responders to wounding. 
as well as uh, cells from the adaptive immune system like T, T cells. So by testing these different cell types in the scale pluck assay, what I found is that longer Han cells are the ones that are those motile cells eating debris. So let's play this movie now where the longer Han cells are labeled, and you can see they pick up axon debris after it degenerates and start moving all around. And I'll just show you a still over here where you can see really clearly they, they pack the axon debris into a large um, compartment within, inside these cells. So this is really exciting because longer Han cells are, haven't really been implicated in phagocytosis of um, cellular debris before. They're mainly thought to be involved in protecting against foreign, um, foreign invasion in the skin. So <clears throat> let's summarize part two here. So I've shown you that I've developed this new uh, scale pluck assay, which is a really simple system to study axon degeneration. I've also shown you that FK866 potently blocks axon degeneration after injury, and also shows as a proof of principle that you could use the scale pluck assay for chemical screening of compounds that might be impacting degeneration or phagocytosis. And third point is that there's two novel phagocytes eating uh, axon debris in the fish skin, these keratinocytes and the longer Han cells. And I believe they might, I, might, this phagocytic ability might have really important implications for other kinds of wounding as well. So in terms of future directions here, um, I'm really interested in trying to understand how these skin resident phagocytes are involved in nerve and tissue repair. I think initially I'd like to focus on the longer Han cells because I think they're um, really interesting cell type in the skin. So the first question I'd want to ask is, is uh, sort of a basic question just about how and when do longer Han cells populate the fish skin since that hasn't been described before. And in particular, is it correlated with other events in skin maturation that I've seen? Okay, now, <clears throat> another question would be, how are longer Han cells and keratinocytes as well able to recognize axon debris after axon degeneration? And how do they respond? So we have some hints as to what might be going on here. And I'll show you a movie here from uh, a larval axotomy that I did where I've labeled phosphatidylserine in green using a secreted annexin-5 fused to YFP. And phosphatidylserine is this sort of eat me signal that a lot of cells expose as they're, as they're dying. And then what I did is cut these axons right here. And what you see as these axons degenerate, very briefly they're labeled with phosphatidylserine as they're degenerating, suggesting this could be a candidate uh, recognition signal that these phagocytes would recognize. All right. And the third question is, what are the functional consequences of phagocyte loss on the remodeling and repair regeneration process? And we have some initial clues that um, these phagocytes are not only involved in clearing debris, but also might be involved in promoting regeneration. And there's been a lot of interest in uh, human skin in understanding the relationship between longer Han cells and axons. So for example, here, this image, we can see regenerating axons in, in humans are tightly associated with longer Han cells as they re-enter the skin. So this is something where we could really use the power of the fish to watch this whole process happen in the living animal. And in terms of the long-term potential, I think the fish are really a great system in terms of thinking about using the power of genetics to identify new regulators of remodeling and repair. I think, as I mentioned, you could also use this scale pluck assay as a platform for chemical screening for regulators of uh, uh, axon degeneration and clearance. And finally, um, I'm interested in trying to understand how these remodeling and repair events might be activated or inhibited in humans that have peripheral neuropathies. And there's actually been an association that's previously been described between longer Han cells shown in red and patients with peripheral neuropathy. So here you can see increased density of longer Han cells in the epidermis of uh, a biopsy from a patient with with peripheral neuropathy. But it's not understood how longer Han cells contribute to, to this process. So I think there's some interesting avenues here where maybe um, you know, future collaborations or developing fish models of these diseases would be really useful. All right, so I'd like to thank um, Alvaro, who's been my postdoc mentor, who's been incredibly supportive during this project and really encouraged me to um, develop the juvenile and adult system 
Also like to thank T, who's an undergraduate, who did some of the regeneration and scale development studies. Um, Marianne for EM help, lots of labs for fish reagents, and also um, funding sources. So I'd be happy to answer more questions. Thank you. Yeah, this is something I'm yeah, very curious about as well. So the longer hunt cells are already in the skin. They just hang out there throughout animals' lifespan, or at least in adult skin. They're very long-lived. Um, how they get there is an interesting question. Maybe they come in through blood vessels or another means. Um, but once the axons degenerate, what we noticed is that it seems like the longer hunt cells increase their motility. So in you know controls, before axons degenerate, they just sort of monitor with these small protrusions. Um, but as soon as axons degenerate, they start moving around a lot more dramatically. And we, we, re we repeat those assays in the presence of FK866, which blocks axon degeneration. It seems like they move around less after, um, in, in the presence of FK866, which suggests that degeneration triggers some kind of um, response in those cells. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but what happens after that, you know, is something I'm really interested in. For example, are they interacting with T cells, for example, presenting them to adaptive immune system? Are they migrating out of the skin? I have no idea what's going on, but that's something I'm really interested in. Future, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, in interesting. So, Turns out that phagosomes are labeled with a specific phospholipid, phosphoinositol 3P, PI3P. And um, there is a lab in, um, in Europe, Harold Stenmark's lab, developed a, a reporter that um, specifically binds to PI3P. So basically I took his reporter that had been used in cell culture and expressed it in the fish skin. So you can specifically label those phagosomes. I've also been able to see the phagosomes with other techniques, like using RAB5 or RAB7 uh, GFP reporters, or also staining a live fish with lysotracker to label um, more the phagosome maturation process into the phagolysosome. Yeah. 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 Certainly, the the bits of most of the bits of axon de debris are really small. So yeah, it's really like you're saying a kind of spectrum of sizes, right? That, that regulates. And certainly, I don't think that keratinocytes can eat large bits of axon debris. I think that has to be taken up by the longer Hans cells, right? Yeah. Yeah. So really, to get at that question, though, I think you'd want to be able to identify the receptors that are involved in recognizing the debris, which is something that I'm interested in, in doing in the future. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know yet, but I, yeah, it's something we could really easily test. It'd be a fun experiment. You could label with a transgene different cell types in the skin and then use a laser to hit different cell types, right, and see if the longer hunt cells are eating debris. You can also do wounding assays and, and look at the same thing. So, yeah, something, you know, great idea. Yeah, I haven't tried that. It's an interesting experiment. So they, they know some, some about the scrambleases that are involved in flipping um, phosphatidylserine out to the 
outer leaflet of the, the plasma membrane. So I don't know if there's a way to um, prematurely expose it. Maybe if you had an activated version of one of those scramble aces, you could do that. But another idea would be to inhibit function of the scramble aces and see if the debris hung around for longer, right? Would be, or you could also potentially overexpress the secreted in XM5 and see if you delayed uptake of the debris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, great question. So, so there's not much that's been done on that particular issue. So there are some old experiments that tried, not in zebrafish, but in other types of fish, that tried to establish what the dermatome looks like in fish. So, you know, they could basically ablate, you know, several neighboring DRGs and then test parts of the fish that no longer responded to touch, for example. And they find that the dermatomes run up and down, so dorsal ventral, but probably extend across the width of maybe two scales wide, something like that. So, um, so it'd be interesting to see how the innervation pattern relates to, to that finding, right? And I think you could do that in several different ways, either by sparsely labeling DRGs and examining their anatomy more carefully, or using some of the like zebra bow, brain bow technology to make, um, you know, so you could pick out different um, different axons from one another. In terms of like the gradient of how they're moving along the scales, yeah, we have no idea right now, but I'd love to answer that. Yeah. All right, one last question. Yeah, Yeah, so I think you're talking about these features called circuli. Let me go back to that image. Because the radii aren't the only features along the scale surface. So, <clears throat> so you're talking about these, these concentric ones here, right? Or maybe they're called serrations. Yeah, well, I mean, the short answer is nobody knows anything about how these are formed. <laughs> but I think that's an interesting model that yeah, they could be migrating along some kind of something that's, you know, a gradient along those, those uh, features. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be some kind of chemokine or something, but. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any cell type that's specifically hanging out at those features. There's some old EM studies that kind of looked at this formation. But. All right, well, let's thank our uh, speaker. Yeah.